This video is brought to you by Helix Sleep. Hey everybody, how's it going? Today I am talking about season two of Animaniacs. Not the original, I'm talking about the reboot on Hulu. The one that was not as marketed as the first season. Like, I don't know about you guys, but when I saw the commercial, an advertising push for the reboot of Animaniacs, it was everywhere. Like that was a massive campaign. And I think it paid off quite well. A lot of folks were talking about it. They were happy with the show. I, I don't know about the, I guess, bottom line for Hulu as far as like the cost of the show, the marketing of the show. Is it justified with like the profit? I don't know. What I do know though, is that season two came out and I was like, oh shoot, season two, it, it's out. I didn't even know. So yeah, marketing was a bit more weak this time around. That being said, it's Hulu. I, I don't know what they're doing. I really don't. It feels like a bargain binge of content. You see like Adventure Time there, Animaniacs. I think there's some Disney films on there. It's like, why aren't you on Disney Plus? Why aren't you on HBO Max? It's kind of peculiar. But here we are, season two, Animaniacs. And actually before I get into it, here's a quick little fun fact, if you want to call it that. It was quite surreal to see how many folks I follow on Twitter and who follow me back who worked on this show. And I don't say that in a bragging way. Well, I guess I kind of am. But like, it's such a weird landscape of, I guess, social media and, and entertainment nowadays that a person could actually like, hey, you artist, you did a great job with your scene on Animaniacs. Well done, friendo. That's so weird to me. That is so strange. Cause like, it was quite the divide being a kid in the nineties. I would never know the folks who worked on these shows, never. Uh, but I guess social media has really changed the game. So you have these animators and artists who might be like, hey, I worked on this show. Here's my scene. And it's like, that's cool. Well done. Okay. So something I did this time around compared to the first season of the reboot for Animaniacs is I went back and I watched a lot of the old show. So I wanted to like compare and contrast like the reboot. I kind of did that last time with season one, but this time I was like, no, I want to sit down and like watch like at least 20 episodes. And I did. And to me, it was like, what about the comedy, the tone of the stories, the, the writing, the topical like takes when it comes to politicians and celebrities and, and I guess like controversial like subject matters. Were those really present in the original run for Animaniacs? Because some folks are like, oh, the, the reboot's too meta. It's too topical. It's falling back on, on cheap shots when it comes to celebrities and, and, and current events. No. Animaniacs has always done that. Always. For politicians and celebrities, to a fault, if anything. So uh, for those who might watch the reboot and say, oh, this is a little bit cheap. No, it's not. It's, it's on point, if anything. It's part of their mantra as a show, part of their template, if anything. So I wouldn't blame Animaniacs for like the fatigue of like, because the first episode was like going after Trump. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. It's what they do. Personally, I'm a little bit tired. I'm like, oh man, after four years of, of just nonstop, like an onslaught of information, whether it be pro or con or whatever, I'm tired. So to see the first episode do that with like a Roman emperor, I'm like, okay, it's it, that's fine. But like, I'm looking forward to moving on with other, I guess, people or, or celebrities or politicians or, or even like original characters or preferred history takes. That is something where after watching this season and then also watching the original run, I was like, man, Animaniacs was all about talking about literature and plays and history. There, there are a bunch of globetrotters, whether it be around the actual world itself or it's actually like talking about iconic things in history or, or literature or whatever. I'm, now I'm being derivative with what I'm trying to say. I do appreciate how Animaniacs has the flexibility to like, okay, they made fun of Magellan in the original run of the show. And in this season, they were making fun of Columbus, but that's on brand for them. And I like that. It works quite well. They, they have such a wonderful character chemistry for the three. We can just slap them into a time or a place or a play or whatever. And it works. Like they made fun of Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin was stealing all these kinds of ideas from like Dot and Yakko and whatever, and then taking it to the patent office, which I don't know about the historical validity of Franklin. If, did he steal ideas? I don't think he did. He's actually like one of the more acceptable founding fathers, which I guess we hate on the curve when it comes to those things. But 
That being said, the episode was still fun nonetheless to watch and see them rip on Benjamin Franklin and how he had like turkey pictures everywhere. Notice that, that was pretty good. For those who don't know, Franklin wanted the national bird for America to be the turkey, not the bald eagle. Uh, clearly, he didn't get his way. Now, I did notice that when the show popped up on my screen, I was like, TV 14, what? Uh, that was an error. So I was like, wait, this show's not that like risque with its comedy or innuendos, but uh, it, it is TV PG, but not, not 14, that was an error. That being said, there were quite a few jokes that like, again, on brand with Animaniacs, definitely push the envelope when it comes to like making innuendo. There was a part where like the Donald Trump like emperor got attacked by a tiger and he's like, ah, ah, uh, get this pussy off. And then like Yakko cuts it off, goes, good night everybody. And then he continues the sentence off of me. So like that was, <laughs> that was good. So as far as staying loyal to the original comedy and, and just the, the energy of the Animaniacs, it's there. It really is. It's one of the better reboots for staying faithful and true to like the formula, energy, writing, chemistry of the Animaniacs, and especially for Pinky and the Brain. I, I love Pinky and the Brain above all else when it comes to the reboot. There there's something about it where where they do their crazy scientific or global, like we're gonna take over the world stuff. It feels like back in the 90s, it works so well with the landscape of politics then, and it works just as well today. We got like Brian who went to like a dictator convention with like Putin and the guy who was like the president of Venezuela. And then you got like Kim Jong-un and, and how they dunk on him. I, I liked that. That was fun. Pinky and the Brain, without skipping a beat, it, it felt like a bunch of friends who walked out of a time capsule and just picked up right where they left off. And you even have like that, that new character called Julia, like the girl rat from the first season. She reappears in this season. She's great. I, I love her chemistry. There's even a little bit of like a back and forth where I think Brain and her might have some kind of romantic energy. We'll see where it goes. So yes, the meta humor, the, the, the current event humor, uh, weighing in on celebrities and politicians. I keep saying that ad, ad nauseum, but that's Animaniacs for you. That's what it was originally, that's what it is still, and I appreciate that. Animation's great. Something I did want to like compare and contrast was like, okay, some of these like one-off characters who show up, like the host for the uh, beauty pageant or some guy who was doing like the auctioning at like a storage unit like auction, they look so like <laughs> detailed, almost like caricatures with like the folds in their skin and, and the details in their face and it's appreciated. But I was like, were the humans and Animaniacs always this like extravagant with their features and cartoony? And I guess the answer is like kind of yes, but like I think this new reboot goes even further with that and it's appreciated. They, they look cartoony, they look bizarre and you can see the effort that goes into it. So like, well done, I, I like that. We drill into the, the the new boss of Warner Brothers. I forget her name. She, she shows up like three or four times and even gets her own story about like her family and how like they're all competitive. We get to see her daughter. Now she's like a 16 year old brat. We even see some of the original characters. Like there was a magazine with like a slappy squirrel. A Chicken Boo shows up again. There's a Noah's Ark like episode, which by the way, they did that in the original series as well. So I appreciate that they're not intimidated by like, oh, we can't do this history story. It's too graphic or violent or uncomfortable. No, they still go after it. If anything, they point blank bring up how uncomfortable it is. I appreciate that. Thank you for having like the cojones to like not wither when it comes to history or topical things that might like make you uncomfortable. Because that's not how the Animaniacs operate. They're very bored with their thoughts and they'll speak their minds, especially Yakko. We even got like this 1980s like Thundercats homage, wonderful animation with Yakko as like Gosh, what's the Thundercats main character? Lionel? Uh, that, that was fun. I, I think I prefer the overly anime sequence from the first season, but this is still fun, still well done. All in all though, I guess to summarize my, my rambling, is that this was a very good uh, sequel, a, a very good second season that still runs with the energy of the first season and, and it's greatly appreciated. I think they, the folks who are running this show have done their homework. They know what made the original series so special, whether it be something abstract or chaotic or topical or whatever. Animaniacs has that latitude to just do whatever they want and slap them over something, which is like very Looney Tuney energy. We even see Daffy Duck in this, in this show. And I think Yakko is like, do we even have the rights to use this character? So overall, I walk away from the second season with a smile on my face and I appreciate it. I think it's doing great. I hope they get a season three. Maybe they might find themselves back on HBO Max like at the end of the day. I don't know. We'll see what the contracts have to say when it comes to streaming services and, and copyright and whatnot. But 
Overall, I recommend season two of Animaniacs. If you've seen it, let me know what you think in the comments and I will see you all next time. Narf. So a big old shout out to this video sponsor, Helix Sleep. Well folks, I've had my mattress for almost a year now and it is amazing. Honestly, it's kind of wild how much my mattress has become such a staple of my life. I mean, we spend like one third of our lives sleeping, so it only makes sense to get a bed that is super comfy and fits your personal needs. I'm actually writing the script for my next video in my Helix bed at this very moment. Well, like not while recording, but when I was tired. You get the idea. For those who don't know, Helix makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your front door. And when it comes to bed preferences, everybody is different and Helix knows that. So they made a sleep quiz that matches your unique body type, sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Do you prefer to have a firm mattress or one that is super soft? Perhaps a combo of both. And what position do you sleep in? On your side, on your stomach, or on your back? And for those who share a bed with a partner, you can have them take the quiz alongside you. So you both can find a perfect compromise. When I took the sleep quiz, I was like, yeah, I sleep on my side. And I also like a mattress that is soft, but somewhat firm. And he looked was like, boom, the midnight Lux is what you want. And they were absolutely correct. I also ordered a queen size because the pets in my house like to take up a lot of space. Look at these little jerks. Honestly, the comfort levels of the midnight Lux blows my old mattress out of the water. It's not even a contest. I've been having the best sleep of my life since I got my Helix, and that is the truth. Also, I still can't believe how this mattress was mailed to my front door for free. When it first arrived, I was like, no, there's no way an entire mattress can fit into this box. And then I opened it and poof, there it was. Uh, a word of advice, open the box in a room that is kind of empty so you can let your mattress expand and breathe before officially setting it up. I got pinned against the wall, as you can see. This isn't part of the plan. And if you're hesitant about buying a Helix that you haven't been able to try, no worries. There's a 100 night sleep trial. So you have over three months to try out your selection and make sure that you love it. If you don't, Helix will pick up the mattress and you will get a full refund. So I absolutely recommend Helix Sleep. I'm a very happy customer, and I think that owning a quality mattress is very important, especially one that can be literally mailed to your front door. So if you're in the market looking for a new bed, then check out Helix. Click the link down below or go to helixsleep.com slash saberspark and get up to $200 off your Helix mattress. Hell, they even throw in two pillows for free. So go check them out.